ladies and gentlemen, if I can have your attention, please. If you want to be seated, please do. Make yourself counted. You too, Joe. Thank you. At this time, what we'll do, I will open up a public hearing, but first we'll pledge of allegiance, if you'd be so kind. Please stand. Pledge of allegiance to the flag. Geography issue is down in the area of the state that I lived in for 11 years and just loved it. Uh, but I've been very happy here in Webster. We've had great boards and great projects. So thank you for six excellent years. And uh, I'm only a phone call away, and anyone that knows me knows that uh, that's a sincere offer. So, so, so I guess I have the dubious distinction to talk about raising your taxes above and beyond the Proposition 2 and a half levy limit. Uh, as I mentioned a, a moment ago, this is the eighth budget I've had the opportunity to work on, how eight in six years, because when I first arrived in February of 2009, the governor had just announced what's called 9C cuts, which puts fear in the hearts of all of our, your elected and appointed officials. That means the governor's gonna cut state aid with only three months remaining or four months remaining in the fiscal year, which is a nightmare. And we weathered that storm, uh, and we then weathered other very, very difficult budget processes, I can assure you. We've worked cooperatively with the school department hand in hand. In fact, I will tell you, in 2009, when I first got here, if not for changes they made, we would have been having this conversation six years ago, and that's a fact. So throughout the time here, we've worked ex exceptionally well with the school department. We've always come to town meeting with a combined, unified effort and a number that we can all live with. We certainly had every intention doing that this year. Uh, the cooperation is certainly there. I can tell you the money, unfortunately, and the numbers are not going to come together this year. Uh, very, very frustrating. Uh, we all take this on a personal level. We sincerely do. Uh, we started having some concerns about December, even before the formal numbers came out. Just knowing the things that we've been juggling for years, knowing we're going to move into a brand new police station. I think the Park Ave School is, is a gorgeous facility. I, I don't know that the school's yet quite there in terms of what they'll need, but clearly these are bigger facilities, clearly. So I, we have one, the police station, that I know is more expensive than I hoped it would be. And likewise, I'm guessing that the school department's probably heading in that direction, even with the great lead certification. They're just bigger facilities. Uh, that's part of it. Another part we'll talk about is the health insurance. I don't know if you'll find another community that for five years in a row we've level funded or lowered your contribution to your employee health insurance. Uh, pretty remarkable. Pretty remarkable. That was done through a lot of plan design changes, a lot of uh, working with the union groups for major changes in what they pay. Uh, that's really helped us stabilize what would have otherwise been a pretty rocky road. So we have been very fortunate. We're a self-insured health insurance system. That, the day may come, I want to plant the seed now for three years from now, the day may come when you don't want to do that anymore, and it will be more expensive for Webster to buy themselves out of that self-insured system. So hopefully that message starts to resonate now, because I think you'll probably be in that position in a few years. Um, so having said that, I'd like to get a little bit of a head of steam going, but if there's any questions, please stop me, but maybe just get me, let me get through a few slides. and. Uh, we certainly want to make this as informative as possible. So on the first slide, I'm going to try to multi multitask with technology. So, so the first slide, um, and you should have three handouts. One's a staple packet, one is a, an overview titled the Town of Webster, and one is 
a bunch of spreadsheets with numbers on home values and, and uh, money. So I've had the opportunity uh, to work in this business for 19 years. I can tell you, I think the first 10 of those years, when you thought about the budget, the budget was the school department, and it was the police department, fire department, highway, water, sewer, library, town hall, council on aging. That used to be what we spent the bulk of time on. You've probably seen the town budget. If not, if it's not online now, we'll have it online. The school department's budget is online. Ours can, we can, we can put up online. That's where you just see 10 pages of what's called line item. That used to be what we felt was the, the big part of the budget, was all the departmental spending. That was the real big part. I can tell you, with each passing year, uh, we spend less and less time on that, on, on my side, on the general government side. The school department probably spends a little more time on that. We've worked through it so many times. There's very few changes year to year in staffing and what we need for equipment, what we have for computer uh, maintenance agreements. Those things don't change that often. So it's pretty stable on the departmental spending side. Again, that used to be the budget. We wrestled with that for four or five months out of the year. That's really not the case now. Um, what the town budget is now that really has us uh, very busy throughout the entire fiscal year are the fixed costs. And we've been, again, we've been working through these uh, you know, with, with our team here, the finance team here for the six years. So why this year does it seem like it's that much more difficult to pull the numbers together? Probably the most important question that we can talk about here this evening. So why is this year harder than other years? First, we had a lot of deferred, a lot of deferred obligations that we had to tend to, and we've really been in part of that survival mode. And at some point, that just doesn't work. You know, I guess you can call it kicking the can down the road, or you know, we euphemistically call it clinging to the side of the cliff some years. But we've made the numbers work. And at some point, we're not necessarily doing web service service either. If we're just barely scraping by to do the same, and we want to bring more and more progress to web, so we're not necessarily doing you a service. But why this year? The fixed cost outpace total revenue growth every year. So let me say that again, because this is why you see all the communities in the newspaper this time of year really struggling. Our fixed cost outpace our revenue growth every year. You'll see in a different sheet here that our levy limit increase it's around $460,000. That's our levy limit increase. Just health insurance, retirement, a bay path increase, which is, they've been very, very effective with their budget management. But just those changes alone far exceed what we get in our Prop 2.5 levy limit. For the first time I mentioned in five years, we will have health insurance increases. It's fairly modest compared to what's happening out uh, in that market, but we still have to address about a $200,000 increase in our health insurance appropriation. Again, we've been able to avoid that for five years, which has been a major stabilizing uh, influence on the town budget. Uh, the police station is an absolutely marvelous facility. It will serve this community well for well over 100 years. Despite our best efforts to make sure all the, the energy uh, effectiveness was in that building, which it is, I think a big surprise for me personally, I will take ownership of this, the number of HVAC filters, the number of additional maintenance agreements on these high-tech heating systems, other components of the building that are much more sophisticated than the old building, uh, it's, it's, it far exceeds uh, what we used to spend on just a 1950s design brick building with limited technology. Again, that facility is going to serve this community for well over 100 years. Uh, it is remarkably well built. It was built with some capacity by design. Uh, and it's a great facility. It's much larger. It's, it's a facility that didn't exist. So we had two departments, fire and police, working out of Thompson Road. Now we have a police station across the street. So we knew some of that was going to be an increase. But some of the high tech demands to keep up with the internal technology, and particularly the HVAC system, uh, have been pretty, uh, pretty substantial. We, uh, if you haven't had the opportunity to hear about the Senior Center, I would encourage you. I'm not sure when that ribbon cutting is going to be. I'm guessing in about two months. But please take half an hour of your life and walk through the new Senior Center and the renovated AJ School. It will truly blow your mind. The Senior Center is stunningly gorgeous, and it cost you zero dollars. Uh, Carol Sear, Deb Keith, the building committee then, Bobby and Sean Collins, my first week on the job, that building committee for the AJ School was opening up bids, and that has been a great project. It took a long time to get funded. Uh, 
NOAA is spending around 17, 18 million dollars in the Ajax School of other people's money. The Senior Center originally was going to be kind of a shell, and it they brought everything almost to a completely finished quality, and you just really need to get in there because it is truly stunning. Um, we mentioned some of the deferred operational needs. I mean, we. You know, off the top of my head, I'm trying to think of some of the things we just, every year we say, well, maybe we'll squeeze that in the budget next year, and you just don't get there. Um, it just isn't, again, it's not really serving the community well to put a, a lot of things that are small in nature, but add up over time. Things like building maintenance kind of is one of the first ones that comes to mind. And lastly, I guess the, the, the second most important thing that I hope you'll take uh, from this this evening is what do you want your town to look like? I, I credit Dr. Charty. Uh, Dr. Malikus, his predecessor with that line, and what does Webster want to look like? Uh, we take a lot of pride in what we've done in the last six, seven years here, uh, but we're gonna have a day and age that's, make no mistake about it, separating our reliance from the state. We can no longer think the state of Massachusetts is gonna knock on our door and bail us out. The state has had financial troubles for probably nine out of the last 10 years, as have all the municipalities, which are directly related, I can assure you. Uh, and we have to figure out, are we going to manage our own affairs? And we certainly are here to talk about taxes. And are we going to just do something like micro fixes, which might be on the table this year, so that you look at a smaller type of override that just gets you through next year? Or do you want to do what has been very successful in other communities, you pass a larger override, you don't levy to the max, so you don't put the pedal to the metal and tax every dollar. You target an amount, like a three or four or five percent increase over the levy, and then you use that for up to five years. Towns have been successful gaining a five-year stretch out of one override bar. So behind the scenes, you have very capable people here that can do that. It's the state tax recapitulation sheet we set the tax rate on. Mark Becker, our assessor, is sitting here in the audience. Um, he doesn't choose the tax rate, so you don't have to get mad at Mark. Uh, we have the ability to target a certain amount of what's called excess levy capacity. So we have additional capacity under the levy. Our research indicates, from going back to the inception of Prop 2.5, is this right, Mrs. Reed? I don't think we've ever had excess levy capacity no. ever, no. which is pretty remarkable. So in other words, Webster's been somewhat under the gun, if you will, since 1980-81 when it went into effect, that we've had to go right to that levy limit every year. There are some municipalities that have a little cushion, and that cushion is called excess levy capacity. Um, so we have to decide what you want your community to look like. Uh, you're going to need a bridge in some capacity, but we're going to have some major changes in the level and the quality of services that you receive. Uh, beyond, again, beyond the bridge concept of just getting you to what a long-term plan looks like, would be something that actually builds capacity. Um, I know the school, if you haven't seen the school department presentation, I recommend you watch it. Uh, Dr. Malkus and, and uh, Ms. Davis and the school committee talk about the, the strides that they've made and the educational goals and what they've attained in the last few years, which is truly exceptional. We had statewide recognition of program not long ago, one of the math programs, I believe, for, for improvements, advanced placement, Matt, one of the advanced placement for the Boston Globe and Bartlett for mathematics achievement in the Boston Globe and that part of the advanced placement or separate? Separate. So, so two awards. Thank you, Dr. Malkus. Um, so again, I would encourage you to watch the presentation from the school committee uh, and the leadership on what they've attained in the last few years. Some of the highlights that we take a lot of pride in here and your administrative team, uh, we used to be on a Department of Revenue watch list, which means we had to have certain conditions in place before they would allow us to even set a tax rate. I think three years ago or so we were removed, I just don't remember, four years ago, thank you Mr. Regent. Uh, four years ago we were moved off of that watch list. Moody's used to have a footnote on our bond rating that said this community has a negative outlook, which means they're likely getting worse. We worked hard to get that negative outlook removed. I think that was three, year, three years ago, a year after the Department of Revenue. The negative outlook was removed. 
as a separate procedure a year later, we actually had that turned into a positive outlook. So Moody's feels like we're going in the right direction, which really meant a lot to us, and it sends a nice message into the bond rating, uh, the bond purchasing market, that our bonds are a stable financial uh, vehicle. We have one of the cleanest audit reports that you will find. I would encourage you, uh, if we haven't yet, we can certainly put the management letter uh, up on the website. We actually want the auditors to find things. The management letter, we feel, is one of the more important things to pay for, where they say, well, you have deficiencies in this area. Well, we don't have any material weaknesses. We don't have anything substantial. We now have things that we actually have the auditor put in to say, this is the way we can make continuous improvement. So I don't think you're going to find a cleaner audit report in any community, uh, certainly none that I'm aware of. Uh, this does not sound like we're doing you any favor, I recognize that, but things like mailing tax bills on time, believe it or not, is a big red flag for the Department of Revenue. That gets you on their bad town list. Uh, we've had very timely tax bills, even in a rebound year, which is very difficult to do. I think that was two years ago, Mr. Becker, coming up again now, I believe, right? Was it last year? So uh, getting tax bills out on time, even when every property has to be looked at for their pulling fair cash valuation and get certified, uh, that was a great internal achievement. Uh, last week, we knocked down our 40th nuisance structure in four years. Uh, we're quite proud of that. I don't know what the number is, but I want to find out how many Worcester and Springfield and Fall River and New Bedford and Lawrence and Lowell. I'd like to see how many structures they've knocked down. Some of those were three-car garages, make no mistake about it. More of those, however, were four-unit four apartments, 14-unit apartments. Uh, we've worked tirelessly to make sure that bad landlords are on the run and these dilapidated properties that sit there are going to be purchased, renovated, or removed. So uh, I don't know what the evaluation, what the comparison is going to look like for full, large-scale cities. But I, I actually look forward to uh, having someone do the research, someone capable on the team. Um, I think you're aware of the downtown revitalization efforts that we've, we've uh, incorporated, things like sign up side programs, uh, creating a pocket park, the French River Park down there, which gets an awful lot of use. We have a little river walk now. We're going to be starting phase two along the French River. We have a micro brew downtown, which I'm excited about on two levels. First is probably obvious. The second level is the future for downtown livelihood, for, for being a vibrant space, is that people want to go there. As a community that used to have probably more jobs than residents at some point years ago, Webster was the economic engine of the region, now you see people vote for their, their entertainment money with their pocketbook. They vote for their dollars and where they're going to spend it, and that Putnam has done a remarkable job in that, and getting us to that point where you have things like a micro group near a parking park with concerts and downtown uh, restaurant venues. We have, I think, three remaining downtown liquor licenses. We went to the state and secured five additional licenses for downtown, uh, all part of that effort. And just with some of the other highlights, uh, we worked on about an 18 month master plan process, which was funded through Carol Sears Group and the Webster Redevelopment Authority. It was about a $115,000 project which was funded through a grant program. Um, so I mean, this is the momentum that I hope that you want to see your community continue to make. We certainly have the right group of caring people here in place that want to do that. Um, switching gears a bit about Proposition 2 and a half. So some of the background on this, it was enacted in, in 1980. Uh, the provision of the law that covers Prop 2 and a half, and two and a half is Master Law Chapter 59. The Department of Revenue is the agency that regulates Prop 2 and a half. There's a couple of very good primers online if you want to read about uh, not only levy limits, uh, but how the votes are incorporated, and we'll go through some of that uh, tonight. Um, the process for placing a ballot vote, no right question, uh, is quite detailed. Uh, it's actually laid out in the law that the selectmen are the only group that, act, that can actually call for a ballot vote. So this discussion about levy limit, we'll spend a moment and talk about what it is. Um, so again, we're at the levy limit, which means we tax to the max on what we're allowed. We tax to the max on what we're allowed. And I'm happy to talk about tax burden sometime before we break this evening. Um, so we have that 
which is the prior year levy limit. That is the beginning point for what we can raise for revenue purely from the tax base for existing property. So existing property is subject to this provision of Proposition 2.5, where it's multiplied by 2.5%. So that produces $478,795 per year. Beyond that, things that have been Classified differently, which happens, but more likely new growth is what you think of in your head is things that are newly constructed. So that gets taxed at our existing tax rate and gets added to the tax levy. An average year for us is probably, an average year now is probably closer to 150. I know that might give Mark hives to put that number out there because it doesn't mean we'll get there. Back in the heyday, we saw years over 400,000. A bad year for us, I think we had a year that was closer to 101 year. Um, so it does fluctuate. You like, we hope to see that continue as the economy, we're told, is improving. Uh, the state aid numbers don't seem to show that as much as we'd like. Uh, so that, as it sounds, is new construction money. Uh, debt exclusions vote, which are different than the override vote, those are the large-scale projects that we've asked for support with. Park Avenue Middle School, I think, is the oldest one that's still on the books. Park Ave, Ele uh, Park Ave Elementary then came next, I think, before the police station. Those were closed together. And uh, we haven't yet taken on debt, but the library project, which is a 75% reimbursement, those are all excluded. So that, as it sounds, means we take that debt service and we exclude it from the calculation of the levy limit. It's not included up above. You get to put that amount on top of the levy. So the difference between a general override and a debt exclusion, uh, the override is something that will permanently increase your tax levy. It is, uh, it is a permanent part of the base if you went to the sheet before this. When you start your calculation for the following year, your base that you add the 2.5% to, 2.5% will be that much higher the amount that was approved, if approved, at a ballot vote. So a debt exclusion is project specific. We mentioned Park Ave, the police station, the library, that's project specific. And when the project is done, that exclusion goes away. There is no longer that exclusion. So it is all project driven. It is principal and interest cost for the project. Uh, and as I said, at the end of the debt issuance, then that just uh, literally comes off of the recap sheet. It comes off of part of our calculation. Um, I mentioned this with, with Mr. Avalis today. We, we certainly are very we're profoundly grateful of the support we get for the large-scale projects. Uh, it's always very interesting to me that we get great turnout and great support for the large-scale projects. And boy, if we could get a piece of that same faith in us for the operating budget, that, that really goes a long way. Um, and, and that we know that only comes without a lot of uh, questions and curiosity, uh, as it should be. But we hope that we have that same type of support for the operating budget because we get overwhelming support for a lot of the debt exclusion votes. So the process for placing an override question on the ballot. Uh, again, only the Board of Selectmen has the authority to place an override question. Uh, a general override uh, question requires approval of a simple majority vote of the Board, the debt exclusion, as does the town meeting votes for debt, requires a two-thirds vote passage. So the Board has to vote two-thirds when we appropriate debt service money at a town meeting, that's a two-thirds vote. But both the debt exclusion and override vote are a simple majority at the ballot box. So there's some timing issues. Uh, it can't be less than 35 days from when the selectmen call for special election. Uh, and I think there's a time limit on the outset as well. I don't recall the moment. I think there is. So under 35 days is not allowed, uh, which isn't that practical anyhow to schedule these things and try to at least explain what the purpose is and why we're undertaking that type of initiative. So the override election and town meeting, there's a relationship there, uh, but either one could actually come first. Town meeting is the appropriation process. Uh, you cannot spend any funds, you cannot appropriate any funds without the town meeting approval. Um, so there are approaches to this where you have a contingent budget that's voted and you have a secondary budget, which would be an override budget if the override passes and a contingent budget that would be presented uh, if the override fails. So we're proposing a calendar. Uh, 
the selectmen as your chief executive officers are the ones that place this on a ballot at their discretion. Um, what we're seeking to do to stay on some type of timetable, the board has a special meeting scheduled for the 7th, where we're working on our utility rates for the year. And at that point in time, uh, the selectmen, we would hope we'll make a decision uh, one way or another, that they would be moving forward with this. Uh, we've changed some dates around from a prior timetable, uh, whereas the special election we would propose to be June 15th, and June 22nd would be adoption of a town budget. And again, this actually gets away from the confusion of what's the contingent and what's not. So you would have potential override vote uh, before that. I want to shift, if I could, for a second. I just want to talk about, I tried to keep this uh, as simple and straightforward as possible. If we could go through a town of Webster, this sheet here, that has as a title, FY16 financial position estimated amount. And on that sheet, you'll see we begin uh, with the levy limit calculation. And we have that new growth number of 130,000. So the total tax levy increase with the automatic allowance that we're uh, authorized to use and new growth is $608,795. The, do we have these sheets? All right. Very nice, thank you. So state aid, thank you. State aid revenue, um, you'll see HWM, that stands for House Ways and Means. The state adoption budget process will have uh, governors Budget come out first, usually the third or last week in January. The governor released those numbers, which weren't that different than these numbers. Uh, I think the House Ways and Means, when we net out, we get the revenue side, which we get excited about. We also get charges taken away from the revenue. So the state sends us two numbers, the money and the charges. So the money was a little higher in the House Ways and Means, HWM, but the charges were a little bit higher than the governor's number, so it netted out to about a $5,000 drop. So this is a more conservative budget number, but it's only a few thousand dollars difference. The next process will be the Senate Ways and Means, and then more often than not, it ends up in a conference committee. Uh, one of the frustrations of this business now is that this may take, I think one year we have state aid, final numbers in August, if memory serves. I mean, this used to be something you kind of hope to get in March. Uh, it's one of the things that puts us behind the eight ball, we're heavily dependent upon state aid, much more so than other communities. So this number plays a much larger role uh, in our ability to, to balance our budget. So with the state aid number and the new growth, we have in total available revenue $1,304,253. Uh, if only we stopped there, life would be good. Subtracting from that, and this is what I spent a few minutes on at the beginning of this, the fixed costs now have really crowded out the bulk of our decision-making process and the bulk of our attention on how we try to solve these issues every year. Uh, the general insurance property casualty liability uh, is up quite a bit. We've taken on a lot of new property value. We actually had a good year for claims, but we're taking on much more higher property value, so the risk exposure is higher with the additional values in the construction. Uh, workers' comp, I expected a, a big bubble this year, uh, which I fear is coming on the horizon. We had a very bad accident with one of our employees, uh, not, not the town's fault and the employee's fault, <coughs> a very bad accident. Uh, so next year, I, I regret to tell you, I think that's going to be a number that, that we struggle with. Police fire accident is injured on the job insurance. Uh, we have not had a terribly good year. We've had a tough year for injured, uh, injured police officers. and. An increase in that premium is reflected uh, with that reality. The retirement number, this is a formula. All the formularies in Massachusetts are the same. Webster actually has its own retirement board and we outperform most of the state. Most times we're in the top 10. I think we were number 11 a couple years ago. Uh, but we still have to follow the funding schedule. There was something called unfunded pension liability 
but all you heard about 15 years ago was unfunded pension liability. Now it seems to be all you're going to hear about is stormwater management, so that's you know, something to take away from tonight. Uh, with the attention on unfunded pension liabilities 15 years ago, the funding schedule became much more accelerated at the state level, the requirements that we have to follow so that it will be fully funded. The date keeps getting bounced up now. At one point, we're supposed to be fully funded in 2017. That could bump it up to 2030-something. Where are we at now? Fully funded by... What's the state requirement? Oh, is a, there is a day that we have to meet full money. So, our system was not unlike Social Security, or was pay-as-you-go. It wasn't fully funded to meet all the existing liabilities. So this increase in funding over the last 15 years, the good news is we're having a much healthier pension system. The bad news is the assessments are much higher, and this is everywhere. But the assessments are much higher than they used to be. Um, we have taken the smoothest, the smoothest cost curve, if you will, so that we have softened the retirement board, I'm not involved with the retirement board, the retirement board has softened as best they can so that the increases are lower, uh, but they still have to meet the state standard of reaching a full, uh, fully funded system. The Medicare tax is a, one of the federal taxes that we actually pay on our payroll. Uh, the increase in that will depend upon final payroll numbers. The school transportation number is not a bad number. I know the school department works hard to have that number come in at a reasonable amount, but they're still subject to the market. And even that number being a good number, it's still added to a lot of other numbers that, that just seem to be a lot higher than we hoped. And when you add them together, uh, you can see where the fixed costs end up at. The Bay Path Educational Assessment, that is lower than what you may see in the paper because their project, for their uh, renovation and expansion, was debt excluded. We mentioned earlier about excluded debt does not get calculated into the levy limit calculation. Uh, so a portion of our assessment is excluded. So this is the educational piece, the increase over last year, which is much better. Last year we had a huge bump in enrollment and we had a much bigger hit last year. So that's actually not a bad number, but again, a lot of numbers are too bad, but all going in the upward direction uh, it certainly creates a challenge for us. Uh, the veterans benefit, I mean, we are thrilled, thrilled to support the veterans, I'm told, I don't know this, I've never researched this, I'm told that Massachusetts is one of the strongest states, if not the strongest state for veterans benefits. A lot of this is medical, housing, um, burial costs. Um, with the returning soldiers now at a much different age, coming back from Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, which the, the number has grown exponentially in the last three years. So the good news is, I'm sure everyone would agree, we can't think of a more worthy project or program that we would fund, and we all stand behind that. Uh, the reality is we still have to make that fit under the levy limit. Now at some point we receive a 75% reimbursement for that, that can be between 12 months to 18 months. So on the front end of an increase, that's just the increase, is the 130,000, just the increase over last year. Uh, we fully fund the front end of that, number as it goes up, and it's under the levy limit. So that makes a challenge uh, to carry that amount until we start to get the reimbursement or if that number starts to go down. But we've seen some substantial increases, I think most every year for the last at least three out of five. So our fixed costs that we mentioned earlier are $747,000 and uh, 67. I would just draw your attention up above to the page the same sheet that says your proposition two and a half automatic increase is 478,000. So I know back in the 80s, the citizens for limited taxation were, were gung ho to come up with a way to stop what seemed like just being able to roll out any level of tax bill that the municipality cared to. I understand that piece. In fact, in a former life, I was a state regulator for Prop two and a half, and I believe in it. But if, if anyone believes it works without vastly increasing state aid, I can tell you, it does not work without vastly increasing state aid, not at two and a half percent. What you see in utility bills in your home, we get increases like that in our costs. And the two and a half percent number is just not something that is really a tenable number. I think we're one of the few communities that has never even asked a question about a prop two and a half uh, override. 
One of my mentors in this business is a gentleman by the name of Dan Morgado, the town manager in Shrewsbury, a far away, one of the most talented town managers probably in New England. And I can't think of a community that has a more diversified tax base, which is all of our goals in this business, to diversify the tax base, get more commercial, industrial, take the burden off residential. Uh, you look at the town of Shrewsbury, remarkably well balanced, remarkably well managed, and they saw it a major override last year, and it was supported by their community. But that to me was an eye-opener, because when you see some of the best managed communities in Massachusetts needing an override, it just tells you that things have gotten more than difficult. That the math doesn't work with indirect, excuse me, the fixed costs going up so much faster than the Prop 2 and a half election, and then sooner or later, you know, despite our best efforts, there's just not enough magic dust out there that we can make the numbers work and, and yet get through another year. So that is uh, a big part of what I want to express this evening, the revenue and what is left for discretionary funding. This lower box, bear with me, I, I fear I made it more complicated than it need be, but I'm going to try to make it as simple as I can. So the large groups in town are General Government Group, which is what we call ourselves, Police, Fire, Highway, Library, Council on Aging, Town Hall, that's our General Government side. The School Department is the other large group. The fixed costs are clearly the other large group. So if we take out the fixed costs first, and we have a number of what's left for revenue, which was the basic framework of Prop 2 and a half. The idea was, let's not have the process revenue driven, go to town meeting first, and then whatever the number is, we're going to wedge that into a tax rate. That was pre-prop two and a half. Post-prop two and a half is the process is revenue driven instead of expenditure driven. So on paper, literally like this paper, we come up with a number and we say, okay, that's our number and we're now going to wedge a shoehorn into this and make the operation function for another 12 months. So that number is $557,186. But now, along comes the two large groups in town that want to continue the work that we've been doing and make progress in your community and bring you the best services that we possibly can. So with that is the general government group and the school department. So this next box down below is if you were to take just those two groups and make a pie chart just out of the school department and the general government groups, all the, all the other departments, then of that pie chart, the general government group is 30.69% and the school, it's on last year's numbers now, this is based on last year's budget moving forward, and the school department would be 69.31 of that pie chart, okay? So again, there's a number of reasons why this is misleading. For example, veterans benefits being included not on general government disproportionately hurts the school department. That's not our intention, it's to just have a talking point. So for discussion purposes only, if the school department and the general government group were one pie chart, what would that percentage look like? And how would we then divvy up that amount of money? You won't typically see just a flat out percentage allocation, but again, just to get the talking points going, if we were to do just that, that means the general government side would receive around 171,000 or a 2.2 percent increase, and the school department would receive 386,000 or a 2.2 increase to flush that out. Our budget in a purely level service format for general government is 5 percent, just to maintain what we have, nothing special, no frills, just literally bare bones moving forward is a 5 percent number. The school department number is probably closer to 6 percent. But for sake of parity, not trying to hurt anyone, we're trying to target at least the same number. You could make that easily a 6% uh, number for the school department. So with, even if we maintain that at 5% over last year's number, that means the general government budget would increase $387,512. The school department would increase $875,208. So an increase required to maintain level services is the million uh, two six two seven twenty, and subtracting that discretionary spending from up above, for level service purposes, no smoke and mirrors, not feathering anyone's nest, a number that we would need in new taxes would be seven hundred and five thousand five hundred and thirty four dollars.
So what that would mean for your individual home, there's a sheet with kind of four quads of spreadsheets on it. And what that would mean for your home, uh, by way of background information, in Webster, the average home is around $218,000. That's the flat out mathematical average. But what the assessors look at is a median average number where as a bell curve, what is the most common price that you have in town? So how many, what is the, the highest number of homes that have a common value or cluster around one number? And that number is around 175000 I think $175,200. So there's more homes valued at that number. So half of the homes in Webster are that number or less, half of the homes are that, uh, that number and higher. So we tried to be very, very realistic and actually move up towards the high side. It started at a number of 200000 So an increase in the levy limit on $100,000 of the levy on a $200,000 home, now this is for the year, is $14 for 100000 if your home is worth three hundred thousand, a one hundred thousand dollar bump in the levy is twenty one dollars. If your home is worth four hundred thousand, a one hundred thousand dollar bump in the levy is twenty eight dollars. And if you have a five hundred thousand dollar home, a one hundred thousand dollar bump in the levy is thirty five dollars. And likewise, as you see those numbers ratchet downward, if you were to get to that seven hundred thousand dollar number, I'm just going to ask for risk my own. So on a home, on a home of a value that carries $200,000, that's $98 for the year. On a $300,000 home, that's $147 for the year. On a $400,000 home, it's $196 for the year. And on a $500,000 home, it's $245 for the year. Um, so um, we know it is a lot to ask. We know it's a leap of faith. Uh, the community has not done this ever to seek an override. And you know, we'd like to take a lot of pride that Webster has great momentum. And I think this is, this is the time, that, this is the day and age and the times that we live in now. Uh, I won't list all the communities, but most or not all the communities in Central Mass have been through this process, including Dudley right next door last year. I think that was their third or fourth attempt was successful. Most communities aren't successful, make no, make no mistake about that. Uh, I think what, we brought to the table, I hope, in my time here, is a sense of not playing the drama card. I know Dr. Charlie and I work closely together. Likewise, Dr. Malthus and myself, Mr. Atlas, you don't read in the paper every February and March and April in Webster, because I defy you to find those articles. You haven't seen that in six years that the sky is falling, because we don't play that card. Because to me, frankly, it's a little silly to say the sky is falling and then we just fix it miraculously in May or in June. That's a little silly of a way to do business in my mind. So you haven't seen us play that card. So we are here before you tonight with absolute sincerity and the numbers to explain what you will need to move your community forward. I'm guessing there's a lot of questions. If I missed anything, I would ask my colleagues to tell me what I missed, anything that I should have shared and didn't. Um, I'm guessing there's a lot of questions. Anything that, that we can share? I, I do have one more clarification that I'd like. I would like. Are you asking for the seven hundred thousand? Mike, would you come up to the microphone, please? Just a clarification, when you spoke earlier about the override limit, are you asking for the 700000 or are you asking for more than that to leave a little bit of, of a room for next year? That's a great question. Uh, you'll recall we're using the phrase a bridge, or is it going to be a capacity building moment, I guess, for the town? The $700,000 number is that bridge. That is just maintaining a level uh, number, a level uh, quality and quantity of service that we have now. So $700,000 just keeps us whole. It is not building capacity for the future, no. Okay. 
So has the decision been made as to whether you will ask for more or for only the 700,000? I, I hope that that's something we'll talk about on May 7th. Um, I think that's, you know, I, I feel strongly now uh, that I would still make the same decision if I was going to be here for six more years, but uh, I think that's a, a decision that really needs to be a community decision and say, what do we want Webster to look like? The 700,000 just keeps our momentum moving and just keeps us funded. All right, so basically what you're saying is the Board of Selectmen will decide on what that amount is and what the hell the finance for it, et cetera, et cetera. Correct. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Let's say if your home is worth $300,000, you're going to see a $147 increase over two bills. So that's how that would work. The fire truck has been on the docket for a long time, and every year, um, not to sound like a control freak, but every year I take it off the docket, and the chief and I have a conversation about that. Uh, I didn't know that it was fair to the community any longer to not have that discussion about the fire truck, which is a significant purchase, a tower truck for a million and a half dollars. I didn't think it was fair to the community uh, to not have that discussion. So that is on the special town meeting warrant or the annual. It's on the special town meeting warrant, so that business will be conducted the night uh, of the 11th. That won't be put off until the annual, until the June extension of the annual. So. Um, I had proposed and would like to see, I think it's the type of purchase you might want to do in one year, and there's a mechanism for that we did not talk about tonight. It's not an override, it's not a debt exclusion. It's something called a capital exclusion, which is a one-time purchase, and buy that truck and then be done with it. We have, I think, what is the second largest call fire department uh, in all of Massachusetts, so we, we run, we run that as we run that department as lean as anything you'll see, and uh, they've been more than patient with this piece of equipment. So I don't think it was fair to the community to pretend that this wasn't going to come up at least in the next one or two years. We have submitted a grant for that. It's the second attempt that we've made on this type of grant submittal. Uh, it capped the grant caps out at a million, so it would not fully cover the cost of that tower truck, but at least it would be two thirds a substantial amount of money. Is, is, it, is it reasonable to request, or has it been requested, of department heads to make an assessment? Uh, mainly speaking because of the hubbard craft that was crisis last year. This is a crisis this year. What else is it in that situation uh, as we look ahead one to three years? Sure. Uh, we do. We have probably the best capital plan that we've put together in the last six years. We just put together this year. The hubbard craft was easy. It literally blew up. So. You know, that, that decision was made for us when it failed, we had a severe mechanical failure. The truck was my decision, so right or wrong, I've kept putting that off. One of the one year was easy, we, I justified it, at least in my own head, uh, because we were waiting to see what the grant results were going to be. But I don't know that it's fair to the community to continue to pretend that's not out there. That doesn't necessarily mean, sorry Chief, 
that it gets funded this year, but the community needs to know that that's a major piece of equipment that's going to have to be looked at. So I agree, but uh, I guess from, again, the, the bills that are going to be incurred by homeowners this year, how does all of that outside of this prop two and a half exclusion, a levy, uh, is going to hit us? Uh, can you give us insight? Uh, as to ID the water sewer department, I, I think we're going to see a very large increase there. Um, any other articles that, uh, you know, the sidewalk, and anything else? And to what extent is, it, is that reasonable for a homeowner to assume? Say that um, a fire truck is passed at 1.5 million and is decided upon, we paid in a year. Is that going to be assessed at 14 cents a thousand? Well, that would be that's the that's the mechanics of the levy. So yes, it would be the same thing. It would be the seven cents on a hundred thousand for a hundred thousand dollar home. I've kind of gotten that out of my narrative and just tried to stay with the hundred thousand dollar home for fourteen dollars. Um, regarding other projects, the Park Ave School and the Police and Fire project, and I think Bay Path as well. If not, it's closed. All of those were at the top of the debt service schedule this year. I have that correct. Okay, so this is this is very good news. So the increase that you've seen, which was a lot of that was all that excluded debt, that's capped up. That has capped up. Unlike your mortgage, where you pay the same amount for 30 years, we have in municipalities what's called a declining debt schedule. So your interest charges are only applied to your outstanding principles. So it ratchets down every year. So this year the debt service is actually a little bit lower than last year. Now that will change when the library comes online, but that's not going to be a huge borrowing. That's going to be three million over 20 years. So even as the other projects come down, I haven't done this math. I don't know where they intersect. You can borrow just interest only for five years and you can carry a project. So it might be in the town's best interest to do that. The library's not going to see a full bond payment for some time anyway, just the way the construction cycles go. Um, so you can probably take this debt service down to the point where it's kind of smoothed out when the library comes on. So there is, that's a great question because we voted, the town's been very supportive of a lot of large scale projects, but that debt service already capped up. Uh, water sewer, I'm not sure. I have the opposite view of where we're headed with water sewer. We've had, in the last five years, we've had zeros and ones for increases. Zeros and ones. And we've had more zeros than ones. We've had zero, zeros, ones, ones. We had one bad year six years ago. I think it was on the sewer end where the, <coughs> the rate was way off to actually carry that department. But the last five years, we've had zeros and ones. And we've had very aggressive water program. So we spent $2 million on the Rustin Road water main replacement and refurbishing that tank. Uh, that was just in the last year. So we've, uh, you know, we've put a lot of money into the system, but we had built up surpluses. We have something called free cash, and the Enterprise Fund, Water and Sewer, actually have separate free cash. So um, I don't, I, I think we probably want to go forward with a 3 or 4% increase in some of those so that you can continue to do the type of capital we've been doing, but you won't have to, necessarily. I mean, water sewer, I think it's been, I know the water's been a nightmare for a year, and a lot of that was Rossum Road coming off the street. <coughs> it fundamentally changed the way the water flowed, uh, and it really wreaked havoc with us. But uh, I think the water sewer has been one of our bigger success stories. I mean, zeros and ones, that's, those are really good numbers to run a uh, utility on, I can assure you. I don't know how many pounds are here that have children in this school, but we've all got. I, I'm sorry, I don't know how many pounds are here that have children that go to these schools here, but uh, we've all been getting emails saying you're going to kill a lot of departments next year, including music. We've got emails from the teachers, so talk about the schools. Well, I'll defer. How much are going to cut it? I, well, I can tell you. Um, a lot of that is going to filter out in that way. I'm going to, you know, certainly defer to my colleagues at the school department to talk about specific, but that's reality. Just look at the town budget. You're going to see what we've, on the, on, on the general government side, we've really only focused in six years at putting a lot of money into public safety, police, fire, dispatch, code enforcement, and um, inspectional services. Those are five areas that, that I put money into on my end. 
and, and I think you're going to see with the school department, the reality is they don't charge for sports in a lot of the programs. Webster is a free school system. Uh, when you have as many kids paying or subsidized lunch as we do, and you start charging kids for football, that means a lot of kids aren't going to be playing football. That, does, that seems to fly in the face of what a public education is supposed to be. Uh, so I don't know, you know, I'm not prepared to talk about specific reductions in the school department, but I would certainly defer to my colleague. I can talk about general governance. Um, I don't know who asked that question, I'm sorry. But uh, I, I have posted to the district website under the superintendent's page um, the budget process that was developed for Webster Public Schools. In addition to having the New Park Avenue Elementary School go online, um, we are also undergoing a major grade reconfiguration. And <clears throat> with a grade reconfiguration, it's not as easy as just saying, well, the two grades that are moving out of the high school are now showing up at the elementary school, so we're gonna take one third of this budget and put it over here, because there are different uh, licensure, uh, it's not just a matter of moving resources. You have to actually look at who are the personnel within those positions, how do we support those positions, and maintain programs and access to programs at the high school level. So when we were developing our budget priorities, we were looking at how do we maintain the educational goals that we've been uh, working on for the last two and a half years, uh, as well as looking at how do we um, expand and uh, make compliant our special education services. Uh, by expansion, I'm referring to bringing programs in-house so we're not paying higher levels of, rev of, of funding out of the district for out-of-district tuitions. And so uh, there's been investments in those areas and we, and we want to make more investments in those areas. Why? Because ultimately it will save us money from, again, making those long-term out-of-district tuition, uh, tuition payments. And then, you know, there is uh, issues around and technology infrastructure within the schools, and we have been really looking at, we have a state-of-the-art technology program now at Park Avenue Elementary School. Why? Because it was built to be a state-of-the-art technology school. We now have Webster Hill School, and this school in particular, Bartlett High School, and I know that we have some students here tonight who could probably speak better to to the issues of use of technology in the schools than I can. Um, so, so those were our budget priorities. Um, we developed that budget using a zero-based budgeting process, um, came forward with a budget that was presented to the school committee and has been uh, sent to the town administrator's office. Uh, the school committee asked us to uh, look at that budget and to decrease our percent request increase over last year's budget to 6% from 12%. And it's not as easy as just saying, oh, well, we just will we'll ask for half as much. Because some of the things we're asking for are to be compliant to state and federal regulations around our census, um, making sure that we are, in fact, creating programs so that we can save money by, by deferring those out of district tuition costs. Um, in addition, you know, really looking at our overall educational program, we are a district that does not have user fees for participation in athletics extracurricular activities. When we, when we went through that exercise, athletics was cut by a little over $10,000, which is the um, uniform renewal cycle that was placed into the budget two years ago uh, at the request of some of our parents through the District Parent Teacher Advisory Committee. We also have cut a music position, an instrumental music position from a 0.8 or 80 percent, uh, from 100 percent to 80 percent. So that does mean that we are offering less opportunities for students here at the high school um, to have uh, a music instructional program during the school day. So in addition to some other, other cuts that are outlined on the superintendent's page of the district web page. Okay?
My question is to the selectmen. It is, um, it's no secret in the district that we obviously have more uh, kids in school choice out right now than we uh, do to have school choice in. And has anyone looked at the numbers to see the economic impact that we would have by cutting these programs uh, and seeing kids go to other communities where they could receive those AP classes that we offer now uh, that we would lose or those music programs that we would lose and, and stuff like that? Thank you. That's an excellent question. Um, what I can do is look at other districts in comparison who have um, also got a higher percentage of, of school choice out and look at the loss of, of revenues as they have had changes. So um, I, I'll let Ms. Adler speak to the current year's school choice numbers. Um, and we're finally starting to see a place where we're starting to, to not have the bleeding, all right? Because that's how I view it, when students don't, and parents elect to take their children out of district rather than service their children within district. Uh, so the, first off, let me say, we offer a lot of programs for a small district. Um, through our, our MMSI, Massachusetts Math Science Initiative Grant, we brought in additional uh, students and increased enrollment in advanced placement. We received recognition through that through the college board. Um, we're now working on increasing qualifying scores so that students who are taking advanced placement are capable of achieving a level of credit on the advanced placement test so that they're able to um, actually transfer that for consideration for credit at the college level. So, so that, again, was a grant-funded program that allowed us to do that, but also the school committee made an investment, hired a full FTE teacher that allowed us to expand that program in science. So what happens uh, when you start to cut programs uh, and you start to uh, make things more selective uh, in terms or limit selection, um, that, that we do tend to see school choice numbers go up out of district. Uh, the other factor that affects school choice out, and we can see this in the Southbridge numbers, and that is our accountability status. <coughs> and we are a level three district out of five levels. Southbridge is a level four district out of five levels. When, as you go up in levels, it's not a good thing. As you go up in levels, you get more and more Department of Education involvement in your school district. Right now, there is consideration uh, at the state level for uh, making Holyoke schools a level five. Now, with that accountability status comes an influx of money. So uh, you can look at the research that was done through the Donahue Institute uh, around uh, gain schools in level four districts. We are not one of them. We've worked really hard to get ourselves out of that special category of consideration for level four status. The problem is that if you get a level four designation, school choice will skyrocket out. So one of the reasons we worked as hard as we can to not enter into that special category and move up in, in status, and to be honest with you, when I first came into the district, we were really a breath away of being accepted into level four status. So uh, we've done amazing work in getting us out of that consideration, um, but that means that uh, if, we, if we do allow level four uh, accountability status to occur, we'll get an influx of money, but we will also see money, dollars, bleed out of our district in terms of school choice dollars out. And I can let Ms. Ravel speak to the actual I'll uh, just give you a quick uh, example of, of where we were heading into this year, just to give you an idea of the numbers and the dollars. Uh, we currently take in 32 students from other districts into uh, the Webster Public School System. That works to our benefit to the tune of $196,000. And we use that money each and every year effectively to balance our budget and to offer some of the things that Dr. Malkus has mentioned here tonight. Heading into this year, we send 123 students 
out of district. That's 123 Webster Public School students that choose to attend public schools in another community. That's to the tune of $745,194. And to give you an example of where those 123 go, just so you'll know, roughly 60 plus go to Douglas Public Schools. And roughly 35 to 40 go to Dudley Child. So the majority of those students that are leaving the district to go to other public schools are going to our neighbors to the east and west of us. Hello, um, I'm a mother of three children, one who I did outsource, and I want to bring back to the Webster Public Schools because of the wonderful work the educators here have done. I do have a question at the end of this. Um, I have a son who's autistic, who I've seen make incredible growth, they go from a child who needed a one-to-one -one aid, to first chair and clarinet, who has friends and has gotten off his IEP because of the music program here, because he plays an instrument. That saved tax dollars because you didn't have to give him the special ed, because he got better because he had extra help with music. I have a kid who needs a special one-to-one -one age in kindergarten. If I have to go and other parents who have special needs children and petition the town and take the special ed fight on, it's going to cost more than keeping what we have. Um, finally, Bartlett's done amazing things here. Um, great things to be commended. So I would like to clarify what Jabba said. So what you're saying is if we have a program that's essentially a good product to draw these children back, AP courses that are getting state recognition, a growing STEM presence in this district, um, and a complete turnaround going up a level in unprecedented time. That would bring back money, correct? Well, every every student certainly that we that we hold here is is worth dollars. You have to re remember that every by school choice, every student uh, that either comes in or out of your district is uh, a five thousand dollar tab. Uh, that can go up due to uh, special needs that some of these students may also have. So usually on average you can say it's around $5,500 on average because of some of the special uh, needs uh, that some of these students need and the services that are provided. Uh, but the answer is yes. I mean, if we could bring back some of those 123 students uh, that are right now going out of our district for, for their schooling, we would certainly be bringing those dollars immediately uh, back into the district. Well, if you drop all the classes, you're not going to get kids back. Mm -hmm. Music is a big thing in children's lives. So on the AP classes. They're important for them to go to college. Um, I was at the special school committee meeting and it was listed certain schools maybe certain things if the 12% increase that was requested. Sorry, I was at the special uh, school committee meeting a week or so ago um, talking about that the zero budget was showing a 12% increase was needed across the board um, and what the impacts for each school would be if that 12% was not received. If I'm understanding the information that was provided today, we're looking potentially at a 5% increase, um, of which the principal for the senior high indicated that if we got less than 6%, we would be back to three years ago, where we would have multiple study classes for kids, of which we've eliminated almost all study halls. Um, 15 to 16 electives would be lost, as well as lowering our AP classes. So that wasn't mentioned in Dr. Marcus's cuts, so I was wondering if you could talk to those. So the budget that has been presented to school committee had a 12% increase, and that was through the zero-based budgeting process. The school committee directed the district leadership team to prepare a 6% increase base budget. Anything at which has 
some things that we've had to swap out because we are required to have certain numbers of special educators, English language learner educators. Um, and then we're looking at, you know, we do have a, a very large, brand new elementary school, much more square footage. We need to have custodial services to take care of that property and to take care of that school. Uh, in addition, the fact that, um, as, as I mentioned in that, that our secretarial services for a very large school, school with over 800 students. We're, we will be opening, the good news is, we're gonna be opening Park Avenue almost at full capacity. So uh, we're, we're, there may not be a whole lot of wiggle room there to accept school choice in, because we're gonna have so many students that want to, and parents who want their children to attend the Park Avenue. So, so we've not yet really entertained what five and four percent actually mean. We know that it means more reductions than what we have been able to consider at 6%. Now, that it's either going to be more reductions or we have to raise revenues. Um, some of the ways that we can consider raising revenues is to really look at Dudley Charlton and Douglas and other surrounding districts and look at what their user fee structure is and develop a user fee capacity that raises revenues. Um, and, you know, just in doing some research on that myself, uh, you know, I think that the, the people of the community have to decide, is it worth, you know, 240 or, or whatever amount of money based on your property ownership and taxes, or does that become the burden of, of families, of students who want to participate in athletics and extracurricular activities? Um, in which case, we have to recognize that trying to raise revenues that way uh, will preclude some of our students who are at the highest level of need and who benefit the most from participation in extracurricular and co-curricular activities. So, so those are some of the things that we're discussing. Um, we may have to look at some low enrollment uh, athletic opportunities and say, you know what, if we're really gonna keep a viable competitive basketball program, we may not be able to run this lower enrolled program that services some students who might not even make it into some of these other teams. But we may have to be making those tough decisions, and I think that's what you heard uh, being alluded to by our principal at the high school of, we're gonna have to make some tough choices to get even leaner and tightening our belts. Where we have left it at in the public has been at the 6% budget. So if you read the cuts that are recommended there for the 6% budget, you have an understanding of what it will take for us to be really able to meet a 5% budget. We would either have to raise additional revenue or make additional cuts up to 175. Am I right on that? To get to 5%? Yes. Another 175,000 based on what you've already seen with the, respect to the 6% budget. I'm just going to hang out with you. I just have a couple questions. One is, is the town side doing a 5% cut on their employees? Well, the, the process was different, Beth, because we didn't do the zero-based budgeting, so the 12% was an increase over last year, and then just trying to get to the table, whether or not it's going to be building capacity of a bridge, I'm looking at a 5% increase for the school. So it's not a 5% cut from last year's number, it's a 5% increase on both sides, but it falls short of the the in-depth planning and analysis that the school committee did with the zero-based budgeting process. So if we go with the override, does the difference, because at 6%, the school can't survive. So if we go to 12%, let's just say, does that remaining 6% that we're missing, does that all go to the school and the town only gets their five? I, I, again, speaking, and this is a decision I make if I was gonna be here for six more years, uh, there are, there are a couple approaches to this, and we've talked about that. Um, I think you could argue 
that you would want some additional help, for example, in the highway department. I think you could argue about some of our parks and playgrounds and recreation. Uh, I think you could argue uh, on some of the inspectional services we do. Uh, so I think there are things that we could do on the general government side, and there are things that would be uh, important to us, but we can, it's a different approach because I'm trying to just maintain the minimum that we have now, and that's a 5% number, and the school is trying to get to a place where they're meeting all their needs, and that's a 12% number. I wouldn't have any reservation of saying the town gets to the point where we're just maintaining where we're at, and uh, you know, for, for my money, I'd like to see the, the inspectional services group and the nuisance property efforts continue a little more aggressively, um, and the rest would be an education, supporting education. I mean, I don't have a reservation with that. It's something the selectmen would have to, they'd have to put some structure to that so you can explain it. Uh, but yeah, I would have no reservations. And now you're going beyond building a bridge and you're building capacity. You're getting to that zero-based budgeting model of saying, this is how we move the town forward for the next three to five years. So uh, with traditional budgeting <coughs> process models, and we've used this model in the past ourselves, you look at what do I have right now? What is my level service? And what are the increase of fixed costs as well as indirect costs that allow me to maintain my level of service? Um, we didn't use that process because it wouldn't work for us. We had to use a zero-based budgeting process because we had three schools that look very different than the way they do now. A pre-K through two school is getting now two additional grades. That's 300 additional students on their campus. Middle school being a three through six is considered an elementary model. Well, now it's gonna be a five through eight. The Department of Ed says that's not an elementary model. It is now considered secondary model. We have to add 90 additional instructional hours annually, and there's licensure requirements, as well as scheduling changes that have to occur in order to afford to truly be a middle school that prepares students to be successful in high school. And then the high school being a nine through 12 high school has all the programs and uh, extracurricular opportunities for students. Well, do we lock off a third of their budget and bring it over here when we want to maintain those programs and extracurriculars. So it didn't, it didn't make sense for us to say, we're gonna have a level service budget because there's no way we were doing level service because of, in effect, we have three new grade configured schools. I have a question on the uh, real estate taxes that we could. Uh, the past three years, uh, our tax bill has gone up 7%, 13%, and 13%, real dollars. What do you propose to 2016 is going to look like in real dollar increases? I, I would like to, respectfully, I say this, I'd love to see what, what that bill looks like because I, I would be surprised to see that was the case. I can assure you that you haven't seen the tax levy increase like that, but for the last two, and I don't think the numbers are anywhere near that, uh, three years ago, we were paying $1,700. Last year, we paid $2,300. So, so I would love to see it because a lot of times, and I, I can tell you 80% of the time, I'm not saying you're one of them, people get that remaining two-quarter actual bill and they multiply the increase times all four. Happens eight or nine times out of ten that I get this phone call. So that's the first thing I'd like to look at. Okay. The second thing is it depends on your neighborhood. We are often accused of chasing the lake and we like to beat up on the lake with values. The reality is we live down our, by, we're, we're down by the uh, on Pinewood Drive. But so I'm not sure what's happening in the neighborhood because the reality, for example, with the lake analogy, it's all driven by market data. So the Department of Revenue certifies our value. If you're living in a neighborhood that's expanding in value, then you pick on, you take on a share of, of someone else's taxes, frankly. So right now it's pretty clear that Purchasing a home on the lake has more value relative to square footage and every other characteristic of purchasing a home. So that actually drags money with it, tax money. So I'd love to look at the bill because we haven't said we haven't had. I had this phone call three weeks ago, and I had heard it was hundreds every year. And I'm not suggesting this is your mistake. And when I looked at it, one of the years was forty dollars. You know, not four hundred. So that happens. Well, all I know is when you add up 
a physical number for a physical yeah. year. We went from 1,700 to 2,300 in three years. Post valuation went up three percent. That's that's not common. Yes, it is. Yes, it's reality. No, I, I disagree. <laughs> I disagree. I would love to get the bill with you because okay. I, I disagree. It's reality. With all due respect. Love to get some money back, and it's not reality. <laughs> we do that too. Call them baby. We do that as well. So. I have a, another question. Well, well, not, not so much a question, but a comment. Uh, it seems like we're in a very fluid, dynamic situation over the next two months, and uh, the communication has been such at various times that that. There's been sort of misleading statements and comments bantered about. Um, is there any way to tie the services or to make available to the public the budgets as they vary at 5, 6, 12 percent uh, instead of blanket threats that this program will be removed or that won't be accomplished? Or, um, <coughs> where, where is that available? I'm not sure what you're asking, and I'd love to know what you say has been misleading, because that's not how we do it. Well, so I think I'd, I'd love to know that, because I can Honestly, that bothers me to hear that. So, if you're going to make that statement, please explain how I feel I'm misled. By saying the handouts that have been posted prior to the school committee's meeting last week, that, that was discussed openly, you, you were there. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I'm referring to. I, I, and it's been online, to more subsequent to that time. So what was misleading, sir? Because I, I want to correct this. Well, without actual numbers that these programs are going to be taken away if we don't approve 12%. I think that was the overall state in those handouts. I think everybody recognized those handouts that, yeah. that went to the high school kids that people talked oh, about. I don't know. I can't, yeah, I can't address that. I'm not sure. Well, but maybe Dr. Yes. Um, I, I reviewed that statement. And again, I don't know if it was selective hearing or people saw that there, what, it, what it said was further cuts could, could potentially have a significant impact on, on athletics, extracurricular activities. The audience of the children, yes. Significant impact. Could it? Yeah. Well, I think there was you know, if we have another $175,000 to reduce, that is that that could have a significant impact. I think it's a significant impact if we we go to a user fee model. I think that's a significant impact. Oh, I agree. You know, so so I think there were some jumps to some conclusions around that. Um, I did not see this as could there be significant impact? Yes. The level of. Uh, inflammatory language associated with that didn't come from the school department. I didn't say it did. I just said that the public is being subjected to that type of communication. Uh, not I, just I that agree one with you on that. Not just that one document. It's, um, it's if you go to the district website, yes. the superintendent's page, I explain exactly our budget process. I, I explain exactly what the cuts are at the 6% from the 12% budget and our reasoning behind each of those. But it, I also will say you can go to the Office of Business and Finance, click on FY16 folder, and every document is available there. So I, I'm, I, I, I understand that people can walk away with an impression. I can't be responsible for that. I can be responsible for making sure the, the accurate information is provided. Um, I will tell you that today, I went from school to school and met with staff, looked them in the eye and handed them a letter for a reduction in force. And some of those people are sitting in the audience tonight. Those reductions are real to them. I don't have to use inflammatory language for them. They received that letter today that their employment may be impacted by these decisions. And again, we're in a fluid situation. We're, we're talking 12%, we're talking 6%. Tonight we talked 5%. We may be talking something different next week leading up to June and July. All I'm asking, as this fluid dynamic changes, is there good communication, not posters or handouts, to go to look for 
to say it goes from 5% to say it goes to 4%. I don't know. Take a look at the district website. I didn't see for 5%. Um, that's because we, we're not prepared to present well, that. That's what we presented tonight. That's all. That's, that's the and, and that number was presented to the school department today. And I so we're not prepared to present that today. I'm, I apologize for that, but as soon as we have it, you'll have it. We're way beyond the process. All I'm saying is in this dynamic two months, can we be more aggressive? As, of the as we have it, you will have it. All I'm asking. So the, um, I, I think Dr. Malkus is actually being quite optimistic because that, that's, I'm tasked with a number, and the 5% number was mine to just try to, again, have a bridge and some sanity to what a long-term solution is going to look like without the state coming in and bailing out the towns anymore because that those days are gone. Uh, a 12% number for the school department is 2,069,000. So the 5% number is far below that at 875,000. So that's the difference. So that's a substantial difference. So there's no smoke and mirrors. Um, one of the, and you're absolutely right, this is later than I would like, and one of the reasons for that is the department, again, the departmental line items on our end have changed very little on the general government. But we're trying to get state aid numbers, health insurance numbers, and, and what we're really going to be able to bring to the town in a very genuine way. And, and I think this sheet, you know, this is the sheet that, I'm not handing this out to 150 people because I think it's wrong. You know, I mean, this is something I feel very strongly about, that this is, this is reality. The fixed cost couldn't be more real. I mean, that's unfortunately the, the, the real, uh, real frustration here, but those numbers we get from our insurance people, insurance consultants, we get from transportation contracts, we get it from our folks. So uh, there's, no, there's no mystery about those numbers being firm numbers. My name is Pam Gonzalez, and today I received one of those letters. Um, I have a job in September. And I was wondering if you could let the people know how many teachers we will lose if we don't pass this. Um, I, I can tell you three years ago, the school department lost 25 positions, and I don't think they rebounded yet. And, and I really I, I lay awake nights cringing at the idea of them going through that again. I'm not sure what, what the number would be this cycle. Uh, so today, um, ten instructional assistants receive letters of notification. Some of that is due to grant liabilities. We were funding positions through grants that uh, at this time we do not either have the allocation for one grant, the other grant had been cut at the governor's budget. We know that it is going, it is now in the house budget, but at a greatly reduced at the 9C cut level. Uh, so we won't be able to rehire back as many as we had with that particular grant. Um, so 10 people will receive notifications today in the Instructional Assistance Bargaining Unit, and we had um, three uh, teachers receive reduction in force letters. Uh, one is a full-time teacher, uh, one was a reduction by 20% of their position, and the other was a reduction of 40% of their position. <laughs> Excuse my back. Rear over here. My name is Joe Barisa. And a lifelong member of this town. I saw the good and the bad of this town. I saw a history come and go, and never come back. Look at Main Street. The whole block between Dunkin' Donuts and the railroad tracks. What do you have? All empty storefronts, one big block. Unfortunate. Where is it going? Towards the highway. That's the magnet. I attended all the uh, public hearings because I'm concerned. I'm elected member of the Finance Committee. 
I have spent 23 years in municipal government before I retired. So this is not my first rodeo. Again tonight, we see $705,534. That is a one-year band-aid. A one-year band-aid. Take 5% for the schools, 5% for the town. If you look at some statistics, and bear with me for a second here while I get my correct form. But of the increase, and I'm not put the law like a comment, aren't we all in this together as residents, taxpayers, voters, etc.? And if we are, then why are we not in this together in tightening our belts, which we have done with our household budgets? Because of job losses, job cutbacks, lesser hours, no pay increases. Add a 6% increase for the schools. This is off the website. It's an 800 no, $1,048.932 increase, 6%. Of that, the increase in salaries throughout the district is, and it's right here on, on the website, is $887,000. <coughs> Salary increases for the whole district, from the superintendent on down, is 84%, which means 16% is going back to your students for programs in the classroom, et cetera, et cetera. If we're all in this together, if we're all in this together, Why can't we bite the bullet and ask some of our employees who got these letters, and I understand that probably state law dictates that the time frame has to be adhered to, that's why they were given these uh, informational letters. Why can't we ask our fellow employees they bite the bullet for a year. Bite the bullet for a year. We did it in private industry. Some, some people didn't even have a job and don't have it today. We have a per capita income. Say, so, well, what is that? That's given well, to every city and town calculated by the state. Webster's per capita income is $22,200. The only one lower in the county is Southbridge, at about $19,500. The town of Shrewsbury was mentioned earlier. Their per capita income is almost $40,000. We cannot compare ourselves to a town like Shrewsbury, Wayland, Weston, or whomever. We have to compare ourselves to local, what's happening local. So I say that unless and until Everybody's back is up against the wall. Everybody's. And pay increases, which eat up 84% of your increase in budget, gets looked at effectively. Then I say, something is missing here. Technology was mentioned. through the budget. Can you bear with me? If you look 
that the proposed budget at six at six percent increase for the school for the school budget, you'll find that the technology line items in each school are next to zero. Why? It's 84% of the increase is going to salary increases. And technology suffers along with everything else. That is what's taking away your student learning in the classroom. No shame on me, nothing. No shame on me, nothing. That is correct. And as the economy grows, those teachers will be putting those resumes out to other towns, um, and thus our students will hurt. That's not the case. Respectfully, our kids deserve to be great kids. They don't deserve anything less. There are industry not the buildings on Main Street, not the old factories. What's industry? What is industry? <laughs> Uh, through the chair, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, the selectmen, we got a, I think this is the selectmen's public hearing. I, I, didn't, I didn't interrupt anyone when I was speaking. Mr. Barisic, what we're going to do is get you to the point. If there's a question in there, with all due respect, sir, since we have a couple of different uh, ways of looking at this, and we're not voting on anything tonight, we're not going to discuss salary no, or increases. We're public hearing. With, do we? Please, Mr. Breezy. Uh, what we're going to do is just get to the point. That's all you have to do. Please. What point do you want me to make? You've already <laughs> made several, but there's no question to making any point to your sense to your point. Dollars. Don't interrupt me, Mr. Breezy, with all due respect. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman. You called me, so that's why I got up. I didn't ask you to speak, I just asked you to recognize Well, it's my meeting. It's my meeting. You're out of water. Why don't you sit down? My point, my point is this. When you're looking at that kind of a increase in salary and saying, okay, we want to maintain our teachers. Fine. No problem. But if anybody wants to send out a resume or whatever, they're, they're free to do it. They're free to do it. They're going to do it anyway for whatever reason. You come and go. And I'm not picking on any particular area. I'm just looking at the figures from a financial person's point of view. What is being presented to us and where your dollar is going for an increase in the school budget. That's to the point. I, I do have a question. My question is, do we want this community to move forward, or do we want to stay where we are or go backwards? Because as a young, as a parent of a two-year-old, I want her to have the best schools. And you know what? And I did, because you just seem like we want to stay here. We don't want to stay here. We need everything we have in our budget to make these schools work. And I think everybody sees that. So regardless of the smokes and people thinking we're trying to scare people, we're not. We're just trying to inform everybody. And so my question is, what kind of community do you want to live in? A community that has no kids? Because that's what you're getting. No, I'm asking. That's not so good. I'm asking. I want needs because you started a zero dollar is that zero percent zero whatever and then I look at the town side that starts at a set dollar amount and then tries not to go above a certain percentage and I understand school needs staffing and whatever they need my concern is is that <laughs> please don't attack me but my concern is that we continually try 
to provide more for the schools. I think as a town, we've done that year after year after year. And I understand because of the reconfiguration, you need that. My concern is on the town side, we continually understaff, don't fully hire the people that are needed to try to keep the cost down. We talked about the new police station. We had a tiny building that we had one custodian cleaning five days a week. We now have three, four times the amount of space, and that one custodian is still the only individual on the budget. We have a new senior center. We have not had a full-time senior center director in two to four years. I want to say four years? Four years. We have a brand new building that cost $1.2 million that we did not pay for. You will see at the meeting that we're going to be asking for money to put furniture in it. So don't think we're not paying anything. We have horrible, well-used, I shouldn't say horrible, we have well-used furniture in the existing senior center. And with this brand new facility that they bought, one of the agreements was that we would put furniture in it. They paid for the building. We pay a dollar a year for the next 40 years to use it. We do not have in the budget a full-time senior director. It's $28,000 for a senior center director up from $18,000. Now, this was a draft budget. So I understand when we're talking about increases and overrides for the school side, but what I'm asking is, why are we not looking at better quality on the town side as well and somehow meet somewhere there in the middle? Because it seems like DBW, we have lost a number of positions over the years we never fill them, but they somehow get that job done. And God bless them, because I don't know how they do it. And we burn out our people because of it. So, you know, I understand that this town needs or is looking for 12. I just feel that it's, it's unfortunate that we constantly, because of the population of people and parents, they can come out and they can vote a higher number. And on the town side, we, we just came to seem to keep eating at it. So I guess my question is, if we approve a specific number, a percent for the school and a percent for the town, will we see in those line items where that additional money is going to be reflected and how it's going to be spent so that we as citizens can vote appropriately as to whether or not we want to agree on that amount? And will the selectmen consider and maybe this is a bad thing, but we'll be looking at two articles. One percent of an increase for the school side at a certain dollar amount, and then another article for an increase on the town side for a certain dollar amount. And the reason I'm asking that, you brought up, Mr. McCulloch, you brought up Dudley, but Dudley voted specifically for departments on their overrides. They voted for an override specifically for the police department. And that was defeated for two years, and I think in front of it in the third or fourth year. So I'm kind of, you know, we, we're sitting here talking about percentages of increases, but myself as a citizen, I don't know where that money's going. I don't know exactly where that override amount of money is going to be allocated by department, by school, by staffing, by what. And that's something that I would like to see as a citizen, is if I'm going to vote, and I know it's needed, I, I do know it's needed. I've said this before Mr. McCall, when I did a 30-day stint as a town administrator, we needed an override then, but we've been able to plug along. The only thing I'm asking is I'd like to know what I'm voting for and where the money's going to be applied so I know whether or not I want to agree with how we're spending it. So, so I want to say two quick things in response, and then I'll let Mr. McCall take the mic. Uh, the first is, from the very beginning of the development of the budget on the school side, which began in August of 2014, um, we felt very strongly that we wanted this to be a, a joint consideration. Um, you know, Mr. McAuliffe has met with Mr. Atlas and myself since October, and we've talked specifically about needing to have uh, resources both in the school department and in the municipal side. I, I absolutely feel very strongly about that this is not a school department override and I really don't want anybody to walk away with that expectation because it's really about, you know, as, as Ms. Ness has said, what kind of town do we want to have? What is Webster? Go, how is Webster as a community going to benefit? Because 
I work very closely with my collaborating departments. And so if there's an advantage for me as a school leader to, I know I, Mr. Atlas and I drove the streets of Webster many times this past winter, and I can only say, and that's why I started clapping, DPW, amazing work in un unbelievable circumstances this winter. I benefit from their work. So, so I, I need it to be a joint effort. Zero-based budgeting starts, and this is why it took so much time, and my district leadership team worked so hard at this, because we start at zero. That's where the zero comes from. It's not a zero percent. It's, it's, we start at zero, and we say, if we were building these schools in these grade configurations with the square footage they have right now, what are the resources we need? You would think that is a blank slate and, a, and a, almost like a credit card with no limit on it to school administrators who are resource starved. They worked so hard to come to a place where they said, it, this is what we need. So, so they, it, it, it wasn't, I mean, I thought it would be, a, I was a little nervous to be honest with you, but no, they really, did the work and did it diligently and, set, and really built the allocation of resources based on what they need. Um, and to, to uh, if I can take one moment just to refer to another comment that was here. Um, you know, contracts are negotiated in good faith. Any change to that contract language or expectation of change to that co change in contract language is subject to impact bargaining. I've got to say, I work with, with the best union leadership in the state because they are willing to come to the table and do that work with me. But that's all I can say on the subject right now. On the, on the general government side, you, you will find that the bulk of our increases went to veterans benefits. That increased because we carry that on the general government side. And we had a reconfiguration, and, and this was not near that number, but we had a reconfiguration of the fire department where they were always a stipend-driven group, and the volunteerism there is exceptional, don't get me wrong. We changed that to a process uh, where it was hourly. We have much, much better coverage, so we're spending a few more dollars, but the coverage is probably, would you say, is it is fair to say, Chief, the coverage is probably tripled on the year watch? actually people there. So I wish there was a better way in government. We could measure outputs, believe me, because the fire department budget looks like it's going up, but the outputs and the uh, people in the station has probably tripled over the last three years. The regional dispatch has been a bit of a bugaboo for us that we really uh, continue to work towards that third community. So the cost of that has been substantial to carry that. Well, it's still a two community configuration. We need a third. We've had two communities very close, one particularly close, one, I guess, more value, uh, evaluation driven. Even without the two town regional dispatch center that has pushed the cost up substantially for dispatch, even without that, we have something in the state called emergency medical dispatching where we had to address this. I'm astonished that you haven't seen this uh, in the newspaper and the nightly news more. Uh, I think, unfortunately, that day is coming. Whereas, if I'm on line one, but I call first, and I have a sore toe, and God forbid you've got a person on line two not breathing, when you have a single dispatcher, they have to stay on that medical call until someone actually arrives. So, uh, there's a lot of triggering of calls to other departments when you have a single dispatch configuration. So, we now have a double dispatch and, and possibly a third on a shift as we move towards a third member community. So part of that, again, is a bit of a bridge for us to get to that third member community. I think it will happen uh, with a particular community. I'm, I'm very confident a community will sign on because the state is stepping away from the individual dispatch centers. There's 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts. At one point, there was probably 300 dispatch centers. There's only now maybe a dozen regionals. So whatever that number is now, there's probably still, I don't know, 250 of that being very optimistic. Uh, I think in Los Angeles, there's two. I know Greg Renske would know, right? The state of Maine, there's something like two. So this is such a kind of provincial, parochial, Massachusetts thing where we all had to have our own dispatch center. 
and we're getting away from that. So that's been a, a big change or a big budget uh, item for us to work through uh, to come to mind. I mean, those are were a couple of the, the big ones. Again, the veterans we carry, uh, police. We moved a person within the building that had worked in the code enforcement for a long time, and we backfilled that slot with someone who has two master's degrees, one in urban planning. So that was about a $20,000 hit. That's a good size hit for our side when we look at that. Uh, again, you don't measure outputs that well in this business. That was a percentage increase that was substantial, but not a, a uh, substantial dollar increase necessarily. So uh, what we want to do on the general government side is, is continue doing just that. I, I think we certainly could put a much better team together with the staff that would look at things like weed treatment and and parks and playgrounds, something that I think we take it to that next level. Recreation, when you look at these communities, I think it was Sharon, Mass, that was voted one of the best places to live in America. You know, you look at arts, culture, entertainment, those are the things we need to move towards. Uh, we're not there yet. That's the eight or nine or 10% budget on my end. I'm not there yet. You know, the school is ahead of me with the zero-based budgeting component. So um, we're okay with getting to that 5%. Likewise, we have contracts that haven't settled in a long time. We've just recently settled fire, DPW and clerical. We've been uh, uh, bargaining quite long uh, with the remaining group that's going to go to full panel arbitration. So that's, uh, so that's kind of the counterpart that's happening on our labor end. Well, I have a question that goes right along with what you're saying and what Pete had to say about uh, the town side. It sounds like this is, this is really just uh, to stay alive, um, but once if we, if we were to pass this override, but next year these fixed costs go up again and eat up the discretionary money, is is this override enough to carry us very long, or is this just a one-year fix and next year or the year after we'll need to do it again? In, in my opinion, it will be a short-term fix, and a lot uh, a lot that you're going to find in this business is driven. Well, the, the fixed cost is driven by the health insurance piece, which is very common. So uh, I mentioned earlier, I think you've got a good three-year run on continuing to be a self-insured system. I think after that, you're going to have to look towards getting towards a premium-based system. We've almost been, uh, uh, you know, we've almost been too good at the self-insured system. So the market now for a premium plan, which means you have no risk. Right now, we pay the claims. We have Blue Cross Blue Shield as a third-party administrator, but we pay the claims. Uh, we manage the systems. We change plan designs. Uh, that has worked very well for us now, such that we're below the market, but we carry that risk. And we've always been right on the cusp of being a uh, an organization that was just large enough to carry that much risk with the number of employees and retirees. So I think I think you're okay. I think uh, the school department is moving faster because they've got these beautiful facilities and it's, you know, frankly, isn't it time Webster felt really great about itself? I gotta tell you, seven, eight years ago, not so much. Not so much, even six years ago. I think we're getting there. You know, you have buildings on Main Street, honestly, they've been there for 30 years, burnt out. I don't think you'd see this group put up with that anymore. You know, so I think it's time that Webster feels good about itself and has a school system that it draws people in, and I know they've done the, they've certainly done the infrastructure work, and now they've got those facilities that make that a much easier process. Uh, in regard to the, to the schools and the teachers here, uh, I appreciate what the town is trying to do. Uh, the two school improvements, the, the, new, the new school and Bay Path, uh, I came from the special elections order for to pass those, knowing that my taxes were going to go up. Because I think we have to invest in the youth. However, I keep hearing these percentage of increases. I keep seeing my tax bills go up the way they do. And the reality is, for, for those here that aren't of retirement age, I got 1.7 increase on my Social Security last year. And when we start talking 6%, 10%, 12%, 12%, that hurts. And when we talk about state government and allowing National Grid a 34% increase in electricity, everybody can't reach into our pockets. We talked about the new library. Wonderful. We're getting $9 million from the state. Everybody should applaud that. Except 
We're the state. The money is still coming out of our pocket. At some point, and I don't know where it is, there's got to be some reality as far as how much anybody can continue to pay for whatever it is. And I think that's all myself I'm looking for, is some, as other people are, some explanations as far as the whys and wherefores. But I think it's also an appreciation and understanding that everybody's getting taxed, federal, state, local, yeah. to the end of the Everybody's got good causes, good reasons to do it. Reality, 1.7%. You know, the percentage um, increases that you're seeing with respect to the budget or with respect to the overall budget, every bargaining unit within the school department uh, <coughs> bargains in good faith for cost of living increases of 1.5% annually. So I know it's a big percentage of the increase, and I know it's a big percentage salaries or a big percentage of our overall budget because we have trimmed from everything else in order to invest in and retain high quality educational professionals in the classroom. And we've used the educator evaluation model effectively to really provide that critical feedback and to exit some people from the profession who needed to be exited. So, so while I, I understand, but our contracts are part of, of the public documents, understand that the, every bargaining unit was looking at a 1.5% cost of living increase. Thank you, Doctor. Likewise, on the general government side, we've settled two contracts a zero and then it was a one and a half and a one and a half percent second year one and a half third year one and a half and then one percent last day it's not funded but it means when we sit down for a successor agreement they know that there's a bump coming in that year so three percent out of pocket over three years is as good as you're going to see in any community um, and then one percent that will start the process again um, in terms of reality and, and, and this, these are my numbers I know Every community feels they pay too much in taxes. I don't think I've ever worked in a community that says we don't pay enough. I did take the opportunity, I took the, I had the occasion to about, it's probably about a year ago that I had done this, and I went through 30 communities, population ranging from about 15.5, looks to be the low, and, and Webster is 16.7, 16, 16,000, almost eight, just a few short of 800 people. And I started at 15.5 and I went up to just about 18, 18, one. So there was, I wanted to get to 30 communities. Now this is FY13. Frankly, it was easier to just pull this out of one book. So I'm sure FY14 is a little different than 15 because we've taken on the debt service. So I, I got lots of trouble, which is why I had to share it. I'm sorry, Mrs. Regis. So I got lots of trouble with this because people were offended that I mentioned 30 comparable population communities. So I apologize if it's offensive. Frankly, I can't think of a more likely way to look at this because you would think they have comparable number of school kids, comparable number of police, comparable number of arrests, and those type of things that are part of our demographic. Um, well, probably a different demographic. But certainly, population to me drives some sense of comparability. Um, as of FY13, Webster was not near the bottom. Webster was the bottom of 30 communities. Now that's changed. We probably bumped up because there was a few in the bottom that were within a few dollars of each other. So we've probably bumped up and overtaken Southbridge because we were actually four times below them at one point, three years ago, two years ago. So uh, I understand the reality and I get that. The reality is what do you want your town to look like? The day and age of having $1,500 tax bills, $2,000 tax bills, that's the thing of the past. And I know it's a different demographic in Shrewsbury, but there's a lot of, I grew up in West Boylston, there's a lot of mom and pop houses in Shrewsbury too, because I grew up close to the border of Shrewsbury. So, uh, so this, is the, this is your community managing its affairs in a way that's gonna make you proud that you're gonna want people to move here, spend their money here, raise a family here, start a business here. And that's what it's all about. And part of that, the largest part of that is a vibrant school system. I was going to say a part of that on our end, safe, clean, send a sense of vibrant downtown, things going on, arts, culture, recreation. I mean, that's your future. Those things like Putnam have done such a good job of. 
I mean, that is the future. And you don't get there without a great school system, great police, fire, highway, water, sewer. I mean, this is all part of it. The library project, I know it seems like, yes, just one more project. Here's another 100-year-old building you're going to spend 25 cents on the dollar for. I know part of your state tax dollars went to that. Isn't it great they're coming back? Isn't it great that Webster has the highest library grant that I can find in the history of the program? You want to look at the municipal law books, they all say every municipality except Boston. I think some say except Cambridge, because that's the type of political clout they have. They've never gotten over 50% on a library project that I can find. So Webster got 75%. So yes, in the words of my dear friend Jean Travis, I bet Jean is here, right Jean? You must be. There she is. In the words of Jean Travis, Webster doing it all now because we hadn't done anything in such a long time. So yeah, it feels like we're loading up on everyone, but the opportunity's there, the grant funding's there. I mean, we've had remarkable community support from very benevolent and philanthropic donors that have been remarkable. So this is the next piece. This is your operational piece. The support on the on the massive construction projects is downright humbling, really and truly. Overwhelming numbers of the ballot box, just reach into your own pockets and invest in some of the infrastructure. Well, now this is the, this is the team that gets to run all that. And that's the next step for Webster. And it's, it's you know, in a lot of ways, it's gonna be the most important step. Hello, I have a question in regards to the health insurance increase that you put on the fixed cost for the 200000 You had mentioned it was self-insured. Um, is that more your fees? Is that more the actual claims? Uh, you know, is anything with your stop loss limit been looked into? Is there a Cadillac plan still in place that I don't have the joy of? I have a $5,000 deductible before anything's covered, and I work in corporate America, so you know, we're still talking they have an HMO with a $5 deductible that really needs to be looked at to get to where the rest of us are paying, because I folk, you know, I kill myself to pay that $5,000 deductible every year. You know, is that the luxury that they're still having on that plan? So, so we started, uh, actually, every year I've been here, except the last two, we made major changes in health insurance, and the reason the last two were held kind of steady was because three years ago we took, undertook the most ambitious change yet. So the first year we introduced uh, a lot of different prescription drug programs, more generic programs, international drug purchasing programs. We introduced an HMO for the New England region that wasn't in place. Uh, I'm trying to think of what then came next. I'm not sure if it was the big change, but the major change was the Board of Selectmen adopted the GIC lookalike plan. So in the state of Massachusetts, they've basically done two things, in my opinion, 19 years I've been doing this. I've seen two things that the state legislature has done that substantially really helped the communities. One, believe it or not, was the restaurant tax. We collect close to $300,000 on 7, 0.75 with one penny. So not a penny on your bill, but 0.75 cents on a dollar of your bill. We undertook that uh, effort, thanks to Mrs. Regis for pushing that, and it was a very good idea. And the other one was the GIC lookalike with the state. So we have undergone many, many changes with plan design. The single plans off the top of my head, I think are 500, I don't, I don't want to say the number because it might be wrong. We, we modeled it after the aggressive changes the state made, which is GIC, which is a group insurance commission. So there were no, to speak of, deductibles or co-pays in the old days. We had a lot of $10 co-pays. Now people are paying seven, they'll be paying like 65 bucks to see a specialist. You know, and they have deductibles for the family plan that I believe are around a thousand. So it's it is a lot different than it used to be, a lot different. And that's one of the reasons we haven't had to have this discussion like we're having here tonight because the health insurance program has been running so successfully. And it still is. It's just to answer your first question. It's claims driven. As the inflation in the health insurance field goes up every seven every year, seven percent, fifteen percent, then our claims go up. So we have a trust fund that we can offset, but as we see that trust fund trending downward, then we have to essentially put money back into the trust fund. Good evening. I'm Randy Becker. I have a terrible cold, so my apologies for this deep voice. But thank you to the selectmen for you know, bringing everybody together. It was said earlier about the only way to make a good decision, you've got to hear all the sides, you've heard a lot of sides. I'm a numbers guy, and, and I've heard a lot of numbers tonight. 
Um, I've heard a 12% request, which is about $2.1 million. I've heard a 5% number that's in the single page sheet here. I've heard a 6% number as well. What I want to do is, is maybe state a couple of facts and then ask a question. <clears throat> the facts are, if the school committee has agreed to come up with a 6% budget, well, let's use a 6%. So if we look at these sheets, you have these sheets with you. If you use a 6% instead of a 5% number, that 875,000 you see here is a million and 50,000. <clears throat> the number Mr. Brees had been mentioned, a million fifty thousand. A million fifty thousand, roughly a little over eighty percent, as I read the superintendent's report, eighty percent of the expenses are salary. So an eight hundred thousand dollar increase kind of makes sense. If you have a million and fifty increase and eighty percent is salary, that number seems to make sense. Of the 2.1 million that I looked at in the budget, <clears throat> it was roughly 1.1 million for new positions, 26 new positions. I'm not sure where that all fits in here, but if we only have 6%, which is the million 50,000 that I'm referring to, the question is, can the school committee agree to that? Can the town agree to get behind each other at 6%? Because that seems to be the common ground. When you put all that together, if the town gets the 6% and the school gets the 6%, we would hope to agree that this $700,000 here at the bottom of this page is increased by another two fifty. dollars That's a $950,000 override. <clears throat> and if we can all live with 6%, then we should push for that override, if we think that makes sense. And that's what we'll get the students the right education, the town, the bare minimum of what it means. So, I don't know if I've stated the facts right, but that's, I guess, how I see it. Diane Mandiel. I spend a lot of time listening to and talking to people about how they feel about the town of Webster. And I do hear a lot of complaining. I hear a lot of people say, um, over the past 10 years, the schools have been bad. People send their kids out of the district. People send their kids to the parochial schools. People don't like the way the town looks. It's too dirty. There's too many weeds. The buildings are broken down and burnt out buildings are around town. It is true that we're not spending enough to make the town look the way we want it to, to make it a town that's, uh, that encourages people to want to move into it. People complain that there's not enough for the kids to do, but we don't spend any money on recreation for the kids. People want more, but they're going to have to pay more if that's what they want. But I think what they want to see, what I want to see is, what, how much more would it take to make it a town that you would want to live in, that you would be proud to live in, that will encourage middle class families with higher income levels to move into the town so that we have a larger tax base. What would it take to get more businesses to want to move into town so that we would have a larger tax base? We have a lot of baby buildings that could be filled with businesses. So I encourage the selectmen to not settle for the barest minimum, to not settle for the $705,000 when we're lacking a DPW uh, person or we don't have enough police presence or we don't have what it takes to to do the code, code enforcement that we need. We want to live in a better town. I have not heard a single person say that they are satisfied with the town of Webster. We want to live in a better town. So we, we look to you as the Board of Selectmen to tell us what would it take to make this town better to live in and to encourage more people to move into it and more businesses to come. You give us the number that you think would make sense to make this a Douglas or a Dudley a better town. Now we're waiting for this. Mr. Manager. 
uh, Linda Miller, born, raised, lived in the town. Uh, my father was a selectman. My brother owned a business in town. And I've been teaching in the Webster Public Schools for 28 years. Um, and to give you some true facts, and also co-president of the teachers' union. So I can address the South. And in defense of my teachers, who are wonderful, and very dedicated to the um, children of Webster, um, Webster teachers are one of the lowest paid teachers in the whole state of Massachusetts. That's a fact. We are here because we are dedicated to this community. And there are many Webster residents that stayed right here to teach. But for 28 years, I have seen cuts every single year in programs and in staff. And not one thing has ever come back in 28 years. Not one. And we don't want to see these fees. But you also have to consider some of the first things that are cut to keep teachers in a classroom are supplies, textbooks. I'm teaching from a 14-year-old science book. That means my resources are paid for by me. And I'm not complaining because these kids deserve the best. But those items, and I thank the town, I thank the parents who helped to contribute, because I know you're buying supplies that you never had to do before. And I thank you for that. But there's a lot more that goes into it that you don't see. Because as teachers, we don't talk about salaries. We talk about what our students need, and we give it to them. like we've offered up both sides of the proverbial question of what we have to do or what we should do, what we probably will do. And that'll be up. And I have to thank all of you for being here this evening. It's been enlightening for me. I was at the school committee meeting. That went on for so kind of long. But anyway. That's right, Doctor. You're absolutely right. The lights did go on. But uh, it was enjoyable just to, just to listen to all sides. And uh, I want to thank all of you for coming, and this will conclude our public hearing. Thank you all very much.